We're going to go to John chapter 6 this morning. Uh, we, we've been doing a series this month on pictures of Jesus, seeing uh, different, different ways that Jesus reveals himself. Uh, last week we talked, uh, I spoke on the uh, picture of David and Goliath and how Jesus is the son of David. And the same way that David won the victory with Goliath, he defeated him with just uh, some small stones and a sling. He went from a humble beginning to cutting off the lies and head, and then the awesome moment in the whole story kind of reflects what Jesus did for us, where when he defeated Goliath, he didn't just defeat him and took all the spoils for himself, but actually all the Israelites, the ones that were actually scared and, and hiding and um, in fear of Goliath and his threats, uh, actually they received a reward. Um, they got to plunder all the enemy camp. Just like that, Jesus does that in our behalf and gives us all of the plunder. So this week, we're going to be in John chapter 6. It's a long chapter, 71 verses. But it tells an amazing uh, story. It gives a great revelation of who Jesus is, that he is the bread of life. And it not only um, is a great revelation of who Jesus is, the bread of life, but it also shows this amazing miracle that Jesus has feeding 5,000 men, which um, we'll talk a little bit more what the numbers will actually be. But before we enter into the sermon and the, the message this morning, let's read the Word of God together. I enjoyed, I guess starting with the new uh, the Christmas service that we did on Saturday, I've really enjoyed reading the Word together so we can follow along and, and hear the story. Because I can say some things, but I think the Word of God is, it, it is able to speak to us itself also. So we're in uh, John chapter 6. I have the NIV version this morning, so if you have that, you can follow along word for word with me. We're going to read um, almost all 71 verses this morning. So John chapter 6, starting in verse 1. Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is the Sea of Tiberias. And a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he had performed by healing the sick. Then Jesus went up to the mountainside and sat down with the disciples. The Jewish Passover festival was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he had already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, It would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, took up. Here's a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. But how far will they go among so many people? Jesus said, Have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, and they sat down. About 5,000 men were there. Jesus then took the loaves and gave things and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they had all eaten enough, he said to the disciples, Gather the pieces that are left over, and let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled twelve baskets with pieces of five with pieces from the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. After the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, Surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. Jesus knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. I'm going to skip over um, to verse 25. When they found him, Jesus, on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, Very truly, you are looking for me, not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him God the Father has placed a seal of approval. Then they asked him, What must we, what must we do the works that God requires? And Jesus answered, The work of God is this, to believe in the one that has, he has sent. So they asked him, What signs then will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate the man in the wilderness, as it is written, He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, 
It is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives us life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me, and still you do not believe. All those the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And as this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall love, lose none of those he has given me, but raise them up in the last day. For my Father is that everyone, my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise them up in the last day. At this, the Jews there began to grumble about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, Is it not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I come from heaven? Stop grumbling among yourselves, Jesus answered. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them, and I will raise them up in the last day. It is written in the prophets, they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard the Father and learned from him comes to me. No one has seen the Father except the one who is from God. Only he has seen the Father. Verse 47. Very truly I tell you, the one who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors, are the, your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes from heaven, which everyone may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh which I will give for the life of the world. When the Jews begin to argue sharply among themselves, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up in the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, I live because of the Father, so that the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate the manna and died, but whoever feeds on the bread will live forever. He said this while teaching in a synagogue in Capernaum. Verse 16. On hearing it, many of the disciples said, This is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, Does this offend you? Then what if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he has been before? The Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of spirit and life. Yet there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe, and who would betray him. He went on to say, This is why I told you, that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled them. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. You do not want, you do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the twelve. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know you are the Holy One of God. Then Jesus replied, have, you not, have I not chosen you, the twelve, yet one of you is the devil? He meant Judas, the son of Simon Escarot, who, though one of the twelve, was later to betray him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word this morning that is brings us life. Father, we understand through this passage that uh, we cannot come to you, we cannot hear from you, but we cannot see uh, the things of the kingdom of God unless you draw us to yourself. 
And Father, I ask that, that you would do exactly that this morning. That as the words are spoken, as we dive into this chapter in John chapter 6, revealing Jesus as the bread of life, that, Father, you would draw us closer to you, that we would receive all that you have for us. Father, you have plenty. You have abundance. You satisfy us more than anything we could ever imagine. So this morning, I pray that you would draw people to yourself, that we would receive from you, and Jesus, that you would truly be the bread of life. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, what a passage, 71 verses of Scripture, all revealing Jesus as the bread of life. And it starts with one of, I think, one of Jesus' of more amazing um, miracles. Of course, it's also coupled with him walking on water, so I guess that's kind of like up, up there. Uh, I joked one of the years that I visited um, Grandma over in Pewaukee, I, we were out near the lake, and uh, the lake had frozen over, so I walked out on the, on the ice lake, and I joked with Grandma saying that I'm walking on water, and she was like, Andrew, no, only Jesus can do that. And uh, but So we see that, that miracle kind of coupled in there, if, if you want to read that, verses 16 through 24, another amazing miracle of Jesus to even defy the natural laws of physics. But right before that, in, in chapter 6, verses 1 uh, through 15, Jesus here doing awesome, amazing miracles. And of course, I, I think if Jesus were to show up today, um, maybe some people might have a hard time with them, but when somebody starts doing miracles and doing amazing things, there's a natural crowd and a natural awe that happens when miracles begin to happen. And especially in the case of people that are in need of this, these miracles. I mean, I, I could only imagine if, if somebody like Jesus, you know, Jesus walks in today, the, he, the healing power that he has. I mean, Lewis, you're probably pretty excited about the fact that Jesus is here. And we know that he is present with us. But in this, in this time period, they have Jesus performing all these miracles, and he's, he's drawing a crowd. 5,000 men. That's a, big, that's a big group of people. Because it not only, we, we've learned as we've studied, that it's not only that it was 5,000 men, but it was also numbered with them were probably children and, and women um, that weren't counted in that number. So some theologians, some books would say that there may have been up to 20,000 people gathered in that crowd. So when his disciples, when he says to his disciples, hey, why don't we feed these people? You know, they, they, this 20,000 people, that's a little bit of money is going to take care of all that food. They said that half a year's wages. I'm thinking, what, around Madison, that's $30,000, maybe half a year's wages, $60,000, $50,000, Because I was like, there's no way, I don't ha we don't have this, Jesus, how are we going to do this? And I love, you know, I really do love Jesus when you study the Gospels. Jesus really often... When he says something, he's usually setting them up for some kind of truth that he wants to reveal to them. And I just see this picture as he gets this big crowd, he has all this, um, the need that they have for real physical food, bread and fish that would satisfy their real physical hunger. He's setting them up for a revelation that there is a spiritual hunger that each one of them has that only he can satisfy. So he gets these five loaves and two fish. It's like taking a, a filet of fish sandwich, right? Multiplying that to everybody in this room. And a still, and then, and then Jesus, not only that, but he, then they collect up 12 baskets full after this miracle. Right. This is multiplication. So there's been, there's been some instances that we had, uh, we used to do at um, Purdue University for Thanksgiving dinner, we would uh, invite up to 300 students to come have dinner with us and we'd get every, everybody to make meals. There's been, there's been different times in that, in that atmosphere where like, I don't even know how much, how, how we're going to have enough food for all the people that show up. One year, one year if we went full capacity, the, the room was actually, we had greater capacity than our fire code and stuff. We were kind of, kind of like, uh-oh, about the situation. But they, they, we prayed and we believed and there was enough food in abundance for everybody that was there. So these, these miracles of God, these, these miracles that Jesus does, it's amazing that he does these things and it's above and beyond what was even needed in that situation. So Jesus does this amazing miracle, but then it gets to this point in the, the story where Jesus sees the heart of the people. And this is where the main part of the message 
um, start to begin this morning. And Jesus, after he had done these miracles and he, he had uh, gathered the crowd and, and all of a sudden, you know, there's more left over, he, he understands the heart of the individuals that they're around him. You have this huge crowd, they're just satisfied. I mean, any church planner in America would be super excited at this point that now I have 20,000 people, they all are in awe of me, and all right, let's go build the church, let's go, you know, expand the kingdom, let's go conquer for Jesus. But Jesus, he understands their heart in this situation. Look at verse 15. They saw the miracle, they saw what he performed, they said, oh, this must be the prophet that was foretold to come. Last week we kind of talked about this, that the, the, Jesus was the son of David. He was supposed to come and establish the kingdom, overthrow the Roman Empire, free them from the government, and, and establish the, the kingdom of God, right? So the people are recognizing, oh, this is an amazing miracle. He's doing all these great things, multiplying food. This must be the prophet. And Jesus knows even further what their heart is thinking. Verse 15 says, Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. People weren't in, at this moment, think about this, oppressed by the Roman government, the rule of the people is, is, is over them, there's, there's, um, there's not abundance, there's suffering, there, there's being under the rule of the Roman Empire. And now this prophet comes, and he's one that's able to perform miracles, and not just physically, people have blind eyes open, deaf hearing, but now he's, he's able to provide their food for them, and they're like, we must make this guy king. We need him to be the king of this area, because if, if we make him king, then all my needs are going to be met, both my physical needs, mostly is what they're thinking about here, my physical needs, my uh, emotional needs, everything, the security that I want to find in Jesus, we, we've got to make him king. And Jesus recognizes this is what their heart is. If I don't leave in this moment, if I don't disappear, their focus is only on what they can receive themselves. How is this going to benefit me? This is awesome. If he's king, man, could you imagine how business is going to flourish? Can you imagine how much food we're going to have? Could you imagine the, the health and, and the life expectancy that we're going to have because Jesus is going to be king? Let's go and overthrow the government. Let's put Jesus as king. But they're only thinking in the physical sense, how is this going to benefit me when I put him as king of the government? See, how do we, we see this a little bit more, right? as we understand what Jesus is saying, when he then reveals himself as the bread of life. Why is this so important? Let's read this a, a little bit again, starting in verse um, starting in verse 28. They're asking Jesus, what, what, was, what must we do? What, does, what works does God require of us? Like, help, you know, if we, if we want to make you king, if we want to, want to establish this government, if we want to establish your ways here in, in Israel, if we want to overthrow the government, the oppression that we're in, so what kind of works does God require of us? Tell, tell us, Jesus, help us. We, we, we want to continue in this awesomeness of you providing everything for us. So Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one who, had, who he has sent. So they asked him, what sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Verse 32, then Jesus said to them, very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For bread, for the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. So these, these people, they were infatuated with Moses. Moses being the, one of the founding fathers of the faith, right? Abraham and Moses. And Moses, when he was leading the people of Israel out of Egypt, and Egypt, they, again, another time where they were in slavery, and Jesus and Moses comes and he helps, God helps Moses deliver the people from Egypt, and they're out in the wilderness, they have no food. It's a really funny story. Maybe we'll do a series on, on the Exodus story. But they're just complaining and grumbling. And every time, God continues to meet their need. 
But the people, they, they remember that story, especially when it's heading into Passover, they remember the story of the man of the bread that came from heaven and fed them in the wilderness. They said, that was a great, that was a great miracle that happened. Uh, what kind of signs, Jesus, are you going to do? Which again really perplexes me because they are just following him. They just experienced this multiplication of bread and fish. They just experienced all these miracles. They were, the reason why they were there is because of the signs and wonders that he had performed. You know, the, the miracles and signs that Jesus performs, even in our lives, are for a reason. When we're going about town, me as an Uber driver, I love Madison because they have really clear signage with the roads compared to other places I've lived. Maybe you guys have not experienced this, but I've lived in places like Tallahassee, Florida, where roads switch names as you're driving on them, and there's like there's like one road that isn't named. There's signage that is one sign is really big, the next sign is really small. Like you can't find anything. It was terrible. But Rachel and I, we, if it weren't for GPS, even the GPS was confused sometimes. We'd go in circles around it. It was crazy. But the signage, road sign, and we're on the highway, right? We know, hey, if I'm, I'm heading from West Lafayette up here, I would know there's uh, 200 miles to go to Chicago, and then once we got past Chicago, it would be all the signs to Rockford, right? After Rockford, then we'd see, start seeing signs from Madison, and we know, okay, we're getting closer and closer and closer to our destination, to Madison, right? Signs, no matter where we're at, signs on the, on the wall over there, they got a, we've got a bathroom sign, so you know, okay, there's, that's where the bathroom is, right? The signs always do what? They always point to something, right? So, so these people had already begun to see all these signs, and that's the reason why they were already in front of Jesus. But they said one more time, Jesus, now give us another sign. Moses had some really awesome signs. He was, he was able to call locusts, there's locusts and frogs, and there's all sorts of animals that died. His, his staff turned into a snake. He, blood, water turned into blood. Hey, we got, we got bread in the middle of the desert. We got water from a rock. Jesus, what, what sign do you have? And again, it's, it's this emphasis that, hey, I gotta, we, Jesus, we really want to, we want you to prove, prove who you are. Give us some more works. Because, hey, we, we know we're, we're about to make you king, but Jesus, we just got to make sure that you are able to do what you said you're able to do. Like, we just want some uh, more confirmation. And this is a confirmation Jesus says to them. I am the bread of life. That's really a significant statement Jesus makes. Just like uh, we opened up the series and Pastor Bob mentioned the different I am statements that Jesus makes in John. Jesus in this moment is making himself, he, he's giving himself like an eternal, eternal title. You know, the other moment that God says, I am, is, is back in the same story that the people are referencing. Well, say, when, I go to, when I go to Pharaoh, who should I say he sent me? God says, oh, tell him, I am. Now Jesus, again, then bring up this Moses story, give us another sign. And he says, I am. moment in Jesus' revelation to them. I am that sign. I am what you've been looking for. I am. And what is the work that you're supposed to do to bring the kingdom of God, to bring God, what is God requiring me to establish the kingdom? What do you do? Believe that I am. Believe that I am the bread. That's a requirement for God to establish his kingdom, for Jesus to be the king in our life is to believe that he is, that he is the bread. The first point today is that in this, in this passage we see Jesus is unashamed how great he is. You ever realize that, you know, sometimes, to, you know, today, like if we had somebody, uh, you meet somebody, right? And uh, maybe you guys have met somebody like this, and the first time you meet them, and they tell you all the titles that they have behind their name, and they tell you all the compliments they are, and what they're doing here in Madison, and you're just like, and you just, it's stopping. Like, it's like, I hate talking to people like that. You know, they did, whoa, everything that they are. 
in, a, in our in our culture, I think in our normal social gatherings, it's usually it's usually a pretty um, offensive, you know, awkward <laughs> moment when somebody comes to me and the first thing they say is everything that they are. But here Jesus unashamedly told everybody how great he is. Say, listen, you need me. I am the bread. I give you life. I have all that you need and more so. I'm great. Basically, is a statement Jesus is making. Which I, man, if somebody said that to me today, I would just slap on the side and be like, all right, good, nice to meet you, I'll see you later, right? But Jesus here, he, is, he begins to establish himself. He, he is unashamed. He, he doesn't fend away from saying, I am all that you need. And that's really the statement that he's making when he says, I'm the bread of life. He's saying, I'm all you need. I'm what sustains you. It's kind of an interesting moment. There's another passage in Scripture that reminds me of the, this kind of moment when the Elijah, and he's, he's going up against the prophets of Baal. You guys remember this? And Elijah is the prophet of God. He's a man of God. He's performed amazing miracles. He hears from God. He preaches from God, right? And he goes, and, they, and all the prophets of Baal are, are kind of, they're kind of like in authority right now, kind of like the people are following these false prophets, these false gods in the land, they're worshiping idols and things of that nature. And so Elijah sets up like a duel, kind of. Let's see, let's see whose God is better. Was it God of Israel, the, the God who is alive? Or we'll see if, if the prophet of Baal, if, if the Baal and the false gods, if, they, if that's the one that is true and he's the one that's going to answer your prayers. If he's the one, that's good. But we're going to set up a, a, um, a duel, basically. We're going to set up, okay, go on to the mountain. We're going to set up an altar. You guys can set up an altar. We're going to see who's God answers. Now, I'm a pretty confident person in my, in my own abilities and the things that I do. I'm a pretty confident person in, in God and his abilities. I, I think I, 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 I have been to some things that it has enabled me to have some faith in, in his abilities. But here, Elijah, again, unashamed of God's greatness, he's like, let's just sh let's show up. Let's see who's God. And you guys may know the story, but they begin to the, they make an altar and the, uh, the prophets of Baal go first and they're going and, and he's like, he's, they're trying to get him to answer the prayers and, and then <laughs> Elijah just again, this like, complete confidence in God and he, Begins to mock up a little bit. So maybe, maybe you guys need to pray louder. Maybe he's sleeping. Maybe he's gone on vacation or something. And then even to one point he goes, maybe he's relieving himself. Like, maybe he's on the potty. You guys need to, to cry, uh, pray a little louder to him. That's how, I mean, confident God is. He knew the living God is going to answer his prayer. And immediately when it, they, begin to, they, they begin to cut themselves and everything, and Baal, of course, doesn't answer. There's silence there. But Elijah then says, uh, sets up his altar puts water on it, he soaks it in water, all these kind of things, and just <coughs> pray a pray, simple prayer. Fire from heaven falls, it consumes the whole the sacrifice, all the water <coughs> in, the, in the trench around it is soaked up. I mean, this is a kind of, this is kind of moment Jesus is having with his people. He's saying, I know, I am what you're looking for. I am the bread of life. I'll satisfy you. It's not on works, it's not on the miracles, it's not on these kind of things. Actually, I'm not even, I'm not even, you shouldn't even be interested in those things. And one of the main points that Jesus is, is making is that, that, and we'll get into that in the next one, but that the, Jesus is not interested in the fan or the follower. He's, he's interested in the commitment, in the belief in him to be the only one that satisfies. In this story, he then corrects some of their belief that the people had. Again, pointing to how great he is. He said, you know what? It's not even Moses that provided you bread. You've actually held Moses too high of a, in too high of a esteem. Actually, the Father is the one that sent the bread at the beginning. Because he's the same one that sent me to you. He's inviting him again. Believe on me. Eat of me. I, 
I'm the bread. I'm, I'm the one that's satisfied. I am all that you need. Because he, because the bread is what leads. And Jesus introduced himself in verse thirty-three. He says, "For the bread that God is, the the bread of God is the bread that comes from heaven, and it gives life to the world." So, what is it? What do we eat? Of, what is it that we eat of Jesus that He offers Himself as the bread that gives us life to the world? What is it that actually satisfies us? And maybe. I wanted to give a warning. I have it at the end, but I want to even give a warning. Some of the things that this morning that we have heard before, but to, to I have been praying all all week, last couple of days, saying, God, Father, I know that it's only you that can draw people to yourself. So this morning I pray that we hear this with fresh ears, with a fresh heart to receive what the Father is drawing us to. But he says, the, the life, the bread that I give you is life. I am that life. So when you eat of me, when you believe on me, when you're satisfied in me, you have the gift of eternal life. And that is, as a believer, that is our satisfaction. That and nothing else is our security. That we now have eternal life. When we eat of his bread, when we believe on him fully, we have eternal life. Let's go on to point number two. Jesus is not interested, as I mentioned, Jesus is not interested in adoration. He's interested in followers. So we had this huge crowd here. And like I mentioned, if, I was, uh, if there was 5,000 people this morning, man, I would, I would shout for joy. I'd be pretty happy. Maybe they'll even write, write an article about what we did to get 5,000 people here on a, on a Sunday morning. But Jesus wasn't interested in getting this huge crowd to desire him to be king over the land to overthrow the government. Jesus was interested in getting them to be in commitment with him. So we went through these passages, verse 43 through 59, where Jesus begins to introduce this thought of eating him. Now I, I was like, this, uh, this week again, I was just thinking, hey, what, how, can I, how can I explain this? I even like, asked a few of my friends, and they all kind of they all kind of joked about um, this, this references, and I was like, I said, you know, how do I explain that, that we're supposed to eat Jesus' flesh? How do we do that? And one guy goes, well, he's good with ketchup, you know, or because it's winter, because uh, it's Christmas time, you know, he's like, well, he's, um, he's tender, and what is the worst of the song? Um, anyway, he's tender, um, like, like a steak. <laughs> you guys are hilarious. Jesus makes a statement. You're going to eat my flesh. And drink my blood. How does this? How does this the statement "Eat my flesh, drink my blood"? How does it correlate with Jesus being the bread of life? He's he is what satisfies us, and he's saying, "Hey, come eat of me." That was Jesus eating, uh, promoting cannibalism. It's really interesting when you when you actually when you look at cannibalism. Why do uh, and, and some tribes? Uh, why why is cannibalism a a thing? Uh, what is kind of like the idea behind it? And okay, one we could say survival, they need food, okay. But then another thing is people will often, uh, tribe will often eat others if they want to receive their abilities. When like I said, okay, studying tribe and some anthropologists study out, well, what is this about the camel? They would, they would, they would, cannibalize, they would eat somebody that they wanted their attributes. So if they said somebody is, powerful or known for this thing or has these abilities and they want to receive those same abilities, those same thing, they would eat that person so that they would become one with that person and their hope would be that they would receive all the benefits of or and the abilities of that person or individual that they consume. I'm like, wow Jesus, you went you went really deep here. I want to eat eat your flesh and drink the blood of Jesus. I want to become so so one with Jesus that all of who he is becomes who I am. He says, I'm not interested in somebody just following me along, getting my benefits 
I'm not interested in somebody coming just on a Sunday morning and, and checking off the marks. I'm not interested in somebody just giving because I know I have to give and, and if I don't, I get a curse. Or I don't, I'm not interested in somebody that's just going to you know, go say hello to my neighbor just because I need to check off the mark that I, I talked to an unbeliever. I'm interested in those that are going to be committed to me. That those are that those are going to be sold out for me. That those that are that are desiring to be one with me, to be one flesh with me, just as if they were to drink my physical blood and and eat my physical flesh, they are to be one. I am that kind of bread that they can consume me and be satisfied with the life that is in me. And some people have this thing that they only worship. Jesus, in this day we see it in, in the scripture, we see this also today, that people are only interested in following Jesus to receive the benefits of him. And I know that there is, there is benefits that come with, with being in one, one with the Father. There's, there's benefits that come, there's blessings that flow into our lives. But, but Jesus is, is talking to these people, he's saying it's a much more serious commitment than just receiving these miracles that I can perform. The commitment is to me and to me alone, to believe fully on me. And I will give you that life. That life will be in you. You and I will be one. Well, just as you were to consume me, just as you consume physical food and you receive the benefits of it, the nutrients go into our blood flow and they, they give us life. Become one with me. I am the bread. Be satisfied with me. Verse 63 shows another vulnerable moment of Jesus that he knows some won't follow him. Let's look at that. Verse 63. Oh, let's just start in 61 because I've already mentioned this word a few times. Aware that his disciples were grumbling about Jesus, said to them, Does this offend you? This was like, Jesus was like an in charge dude. Like, he doesn't want to tell you how it is. You've got to be come on with me. I am that bread. Eat me. Be satisfied in me and me alone. Does this offend you? He knew it offended them. He's basically slapping them in the face. They, they're coming after him. They want him to be king because of all these things he's done. And he said, No, it's not about that. Just become me. Just believe me. Just. Just abide in me. I am the bread. Is it this offend you that I just said that? I, I hope. This morning, if it does offend you, I think that I think it means that you're in a place that you, know, you, you need to be. You're in a place that need that, that God is able to draw you. Because when we get to the place of offense, when we say, okay, there's something in you that's not in me, and there's lack in me, one, our first response sometimes could be offense. Oh no, I'm terrible. But but in that moment is an opportunity for us then to grasp out at what is being offered to us. So Jesus, he said, "Do you, are you offended by this? That you, you okay? You may find you, or, or maybe I have to use the word. You're, are you convicted by this? Have you been finding your satisfaction in somebody other than Jesus, other than the bread of life? Have you been uniting yourself with something other?" <coughs> Then what if, it says in 62, then what if you, the Son of Man, ascends to where he has, was before? The Spirit gives life, the flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of spirit and full of life. Yet there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe, and who would betray him. He wanted on to say, this is why I told you that none can come unless the Father has enabled them. This is, a, this is like a, the hard word, the true, the true word, the hard word here. Jesus' words are they're offensive to us. They, they, they go at our core, they go at who we are. But it's only, and this is a hard thing, if I'm honest with you, as a pastor, as a leader in, a, in, in ministry, as somebody that wants to make disciples, sometimes it's really hard because you, you see the very thing that the, that the person is rejecting of Christ, the very thing that is offending them, but I can't do anything about it. And so some people come to me for counseling, and we just met with a, a woman last night and, and working with some counseling things. And, and I, I can see the thing, the very thing that is offending her about, uh, about Christ, but I can't do anything to help her be unoffended. I can't, I can't do anything to, to change her perspective, to, to, to get her to get Jesus. Like, I'm like, here's Jesus. This is what you need. 
but I can't make her eat it. Some, some of you guys, maybe parents, I haven't experienced this before yet. But your parent, you're trying to feed your kid. I only hear stories or see movies or, you know, um, I, I get to watch my sisters deal, uh, deal with their kids. You know, but like, okay, there's really awesome food in front of you that's going to nourish your body. And would you eat some of it? But to the extent they, I mean, maybe a parent could just stuff it down their throat. I don't know. But they can't make the child eat the food, right? It's the same principle here. Jesus says, I am that bread. Eat of me. You're going to be satisfied. But I can't make you do it. Only going to be the Father that draws you. And once you allow, once you have yourself, allow the Father to draw you, allow your, the Father to, to draw you to the point of, of receiving Jesus, of believing on Him fully, on believing on His life, then you'll receive that life. But it's not until the Father draws you. I can't do it. It's the hardest thing ever. That's why I continue to pray, God, Father, would you draw me? Father, draw Draw them, Father. But he, in, in this verse here, he says that there was one, he knew that there was one who was going to betray him. His name is Judas. It's really interesting, this Judas guy in the middle of this, Judas talking about him being the bread of life, him being the one that is satisfied. And he had Judas, one of the twelve disciples. So that means he was one that, that walked with, with Jesus. He was the one that saw the miracles of Jesus. He's the one that probably received the benefit of the miracles of Jesus. You know, food, they didn't have a place to sleep. And, and he's with them through this whole thing. He saw, the, he saw the gold coin come out of the fish's mouth to pay the taxes. He saw the food, be, he saw the lame walking. He saw everything. Judas was right there in the middle of everything. And what does he do? He goes and he sells Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. This is, this is given to the this is given to the meat here. Judas, Judas saw the thirty pieces of silver and he said, "This is what's going to satisfy. This is going to be it. This is my reward. This is what I mean. I've been working. This is I mean, whether he was full heartedly towards Jesus at any point or the whole time he was a betrayer. He didn't. He didn't even fully. He wasn't even fully committed to Jesus, even though he was walking around with him the whole time. He said, "I got the thirty pieces of silver. This is my." Reward. And today, there's there may be there's, there's times in our life sometimes where we think we're going after what we our thirty pieces of silver. You know, our thirty pieces of silver could be a relationship that we're desiring that this is going to be the thing that's going to satisfy me. Maybe it's a position at work. I want to once I get this position at work, it's going to be my thirty pieces of silver. It's going to give me the satisfaction that I desire. Maybe it's a certain number in my bank account, in my savings account. But God always, God always messes with me and Rachel. If we reach a certain point in our savings, then He gives us another need to me, and we're like, "All right, here it goes. Here's another need." But what is the question this morning for us? Is what is our thirty pieces of silver? Because what happened with Judas is really important. Judas betrays Jesus. He gives the thirty pieces of silver, and then what happens? He really, it wasn't worth it. This isn't what I wanted. I was with Jesus the whole time. I mean, think about it. He was with the bread of life. He was with the one that he satisfied everything he has ever desired. He was with the one that God sent from heaven. He was with Jesus. Got his piece of silver and he said, it's nothing. And sometimes he taught he, Sometimes you read articles, I read articles of, of people that won Super Bowl championships and NBA championships. You know, they get to the point where they, they got the they got the trophy and they're like, is this it? I work, I mean, I work my whole life to get to this point and then it's that's done. Judas, he worked his whole life. He, I mean, I'm in. He's in with them. Got his 30 pieces of silver and realized this nothing this isn't what I desire. It isn't, it isn't even what I wanted. I don't know what that is in, in your life. This, this, is what, this is what I've been praying. The Holy Spirit, the, the Father draws you, and the Holy Spirit reveals to you in this moment. What is your 30 pieces of silver that you should exchange for the bread of life that has been offered to you freely? An opening. And Jesus said, it isn't something you have to work towards. It's just something you simply have to believe. Believe that I'm enough. 
Believe I'm the bread. I will satisfy your hunger. It says in verse uh, 35, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But sometimes we get what we thought we wanted and then we realize it wasn't the thing that satisfied us because we rejected Jesus in our pursuit of that 30 pieces of silver. And this morning, the invitation to each one of us is to feast on the bread. Last week I mentioned that Jesus came down, he came as a baby, right? And he was born into a manger. And a manger is a feeding trough. This symbolism, this message from God is, is consistent through the whole story of Jesus. Feast on me. <coughs> Believe on me fully. Everything else will work itself out. Trust me. I have the words of eternal life. I am eternal life. I am the bread. I'm better than any pieces of silver you could ever imagine. Because now, when we have Jesus, and we, when we focus ourselves fully on Him, when we become satisfied with Jesus and the eternal life that we have in Him, no matter what may come our way, we are secure. We're established. We're unwavering. He never promised them, He never promised them, hey, next time you guys are in food, I'll multiply the food for you. He never promised them, next time you're sick, you know, you're going to, be, you're going to see those miracles in an instant. He never said to him that. He said, believe in me, you have eternal life, and you'll be secure. Message to us this morning. He is the bread of life. Eat of him, you will be secure. You'll be satisfied forever. Everything will be taken care of. Because the end is finished. It is secure for us. When we go through hardship, when we go through trials, when we're tempted by other things to chase after him. No, it's all right. I don't need that. I got Jesus. I don't have to work myself to death. I don't I have Jesus. Believe it. to reflect on this. And I, I think this I think the way that this morning that we can reflect on this is I want to ask the Father to reveal Jesus as the bread. Reveal Jesus maybe even these analogies of 30 pieces of silver. What is it in our hearts that we have looked to to satisfy us outside of who Jesus was. And this morning you may reflect and you may find that man, you have a great appreciation for Jesus and that you have begun to put your full faith in him. And we're, we can rejoice in that this morning for us that have that said, Jesus, you are the bread and it leads us to worship. In my heart, when I reflect on it, wow, Jesus, you are the bread of how I thank you. I thank you, you're you. You have fulfilled everything for me. And it, it brings a spirit of rejoicing, of worship, and not just of gratitude, of thanksgiving to God. Just like we're seeing the song this morning. Thank you, God. Yes. And some in this room are going to realize that the Holy Spirit's going to reveal to us. The Father's going to draw us to Him and say, Guess what? You are actually in the same boat as Judas, and you're going after pieces of silver when Jesus is standing right here, and He's going to be able to do all that you've desired. And in that moment of conviction, we can ask for forgiveness, ask for restoration, and turn ourselves toward Jesus and say, Jesus, forgive me for ever going after something that's not of you. That's what repentance is. Repentance is, is a change of mindset. It's, wow, I have now realized I've been going after something that's not Jesus. Forgive me. Help me to turn towards you. Help me to eat the bread. Help me to be satisfied in you. Forgive me, Lord. In this moment, I've all of a sudden realized I've been going after this relationship. I've been going after this work. I've been going after. I've been going after satisfaction with my family. I've been going after peace. I've been going after comfort. I've been go, forgive me. I have now realized this. I need you, Jesus. Jesus, come feed me. Jesus, I want to chase after you. Jesus, I believe in you. Jesus, help me walk after you. Let's take a moment. I want to pray. I want to take a, a few minutes.
I just reflect, Jesus, where am I? Jesus, have you become the bread of my life? Have you become the, the, the one that satisfies my every desire? Have you become that bread to me? Jesus, am I, am I chasing after 30 pieces of silver? And once I get those 30 pieces of silver, I'm going to realize that I'm not even satisfied with it. Or maybe even now you already realize that I'm not even satisfied with what I'm chasing after. I need Jesus. Let's take just a moment. And I'm going to pray a prayer that God will reveal these things to you. And then we're going to have a time of response. Father, I thank you this morning for your word. I thank you, Father, that you are the one that draws us to Jesus. So this morning, I pray, Father, that you would draw our hearts to you. That we would receive you, Jesus, as the bread of life. The one that satisfies every, every, every desire. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would be at work this morning, convicting our hearts. I ask that there would be a spirit of rejoicing for those of us that find that our heart has been tuned towards you, Jesus. And I pray also this morning for those that are falling under conviction, that they've been chasing after 30 pieces of silver instead of the bread of life. That Jesus, this morning would be the moment that they turn to you. Now speak to our hearts, I pray. In Jesus' name. Mm hmm.